about a week ago, I went to visit family, and on my way back, I realized that I had forgotten my favorite earphones. This was about to be a long flight, and most likely long waiting times, because I was way too early to the airport. But I didn't see this as a problem. I've always thought of myself as the kind of person who can spend hours and hours just entertained by my thoughts. And as hours and hours went by in the airport, just sitting there, I realized how restless I was feeling and bored so bored i was in desperate need of loud music in my ears or one of the podcasts that i follow or a good scroll on instagram at least which surprised me i was surprised how wrong i was in my self-assessment not only did i think i was the kind of person who who had no problem spending a couple hours without any distraction, but I've always also thought that I was a pretty self-aware person. Which got me thinking, do I really know myself as much as I do? And how much do we all know and understand ourselves? I mean, this is a multi-leveled question. There are stages to understanding ourselves we all know ourselves to some basic degree like our names where we come from our parents where we work or go to school but so do babies babies understand that they belong to their parents for example and as soon as they speak they will know their name and can say what they did in the weekend or what they will do when they get home tonight this is more external self-knowledge but it's still how we try to get to know others when we first meet them we ask what's your name or what do you do for work right as children we most of us get asked what we want to be when we grow up whatever we answered then we think hard and long about it as we near college we choose a skill to master very carefully. We are told this is the key to having a successful and easy peasy life. But is this really true? I mean, I've met many people who've completed many degrees, achieved the highest honors. And even if they can tell you all about world history or explain the most complicated scientific theories, are still at loss of explaining what emotions they are feeling and what makes them happy, what they're looking for in a relationship or life. And there are people, many in small towns, or often older people who understand human nature. They've grasped and always pursued their true interests, even if it was the opposite of what society expected. They have empathy for other people and could imagine emotions can originate from many sources and are not to be taken personally. We can see and feel that they're living in flow, which isn't a surprise if you really think about it. Most people spend years studying a subject, but most of us are terrified of spending a little time alone. How else can we get to know ourselves? I mean, we wouldn't claim we know somebody without spending any time with them. And if we don't even understand ourselves, how can we understand and form deeper connections with others? And what does it even mean to understand ourselves to any deeper degree than our names and origins? The second level of understanding ourselves is understanding our values what our needs and interests are what do we want from life at this moment and what is really important to us what are our motivations for doing what we do this helps us make plans and do things that bring us fulfillment even if it's a deeper understanding of yourself it takes a lot of work because it takes a lot of self-observation. 
and it's very easy to confuse what we want with what society wants or to build our self-knowledge based on what we've been told. In fact, most people's self-opinion is based on the feedback they got from their environment. If you've been told you're pretty enough times, you'll believe that you're good looking. If you've been told you're smart or dumb or lazy or a good dancer, you'll believe that about yourself. What is the issue with this, you ask? The thing is, if we build our entire self-identity based on the external world, we'll have no option but to live a life that is inauthentic to ourselves. Depression, they say, is the body saying that you're, what you're doing or how you're living is not in alignment with your authentic self. Which takes us to the third level of self-knowledge which is to investigate where our desires and actions come from. Most of the things we do daily, we do on autopilot. We wake up, check phones, leave for work, come back, eat, watch TV, sleep. We do all this automatically. We have to check on our mental state as much as we check what's on Instagram. We have to ask why did I get triggered today when a coworker disagreed with me? Did I identify with my beliefs so much that it hurt my ego? Or do I feel my authority threatened? Or why do I want to study medicine? Am I really interested in this subject? Or do I think it's the way to high status and approval? Why do I want to date this person? Are they really a match to my values? Or am I afraid of being lonely? And dying alone. Why do my relationships end? Is there a pattern? And where can I take responsibility? Am I heading to the fridge because I'm hungry? Or do I just need comfort? A hug perhaps? Of course, this is often difficult. Most emotions are really complicated. You might really dislike or immediately love somebody for no other reason but because they embody all the characteristics you've suppressed in yourself, for example. You might be angry at somebody and still miss them at the same time. Emotions like this take time to figure out. Some answers are also hard to hear. If you're really honest, they make us really uncomfortable and threaten our self-image. So, it's also important to make sure that the stories we tell ourselves are true because there is nothing easier than tricking ourselves. This requires carefully studying our childhoods to see where our patterns come from, specifically our childhoods, because that's the time where we are most impressionable. The things that happen often when we are under six year old can be the reasons why we get anxious in relationships when we are 60. Our childhood influences how comfortable we are asking for what we want, making mistakes, being independent or relying on somebody else, how comfortable we are with our emotions and so much more. Once we become aware of this, it becomes a lot easier to stop our self-sabotaging, to go after what we really want and explain ourselves to other people and new people we're dating. The only caveat is to avoid judging yourself for what you're feeling. Which brings us to the fourth stage of understanding ourselves. You have to know that while it's important to understand your thinking and emotional patterns, you are not supposed to be perfect. You have to treat yourself with the kindness and openness you'll treat a baby. The measure of being a mature adult is not never having nonsensical emotions, but understanding what's to be taken seriously and what's to be looked over. You are not your thoughts. You are not your thoughts. You are the sorter and action taker of your thoughts. And thoughts create emotions, so you can control in your head which thoughts will have power to create emotions in you. This is a huge accomplishment in self-understanding 
people who understand themselves and can identify their motives this way and not judge every thought they have can also understand others way better and are less judgmental of others. This is the key to being more tolerant and having healthier relationships. Also, know that there will be things that you'll miss. It's not easy to fully understand yourself, if possible at all. You will have blind spots and understanding yourself is a continual process. The last stage of self-awareness is understanding that we're all one, all part of one consciousness and letting go of our ego, which mostly only people with years of meditation experience or really high dose of psychedelics achieve. Letting go of your ego means not identifying with the part of you that identifies as me. It's and instead identifying oneself with all living things. In a nutshell, it's realizing that the I I've been talking about all this time doesn't even exist. The me I keep thinking about all day is a construction of my ego that was built over centuries of evolution to protect myself. Because without an ego, we have no reason to run away from hunting lions or snakes that are trying to have their dinner. While too much ego is a sign of narcissism, without any ego, there is no sense of self-importance and therefore no motivation to rescue yourself or do anything for yourself. It means in the grand scheme of things, nothing we are or do matters. Our big careers, the money we die to accumulate or the material things we dream about getting all don't really matter. So what about all the things I talked about so far? What does it even mean to know yourself if you don't really exist? Because right now, to all of us, we feel real to us. And our pain and suffering is real. Our joy, fulfillment, despair, desire, all our emotions are real. In fact, it's in our makeup to suffer as long as we live. Whether it's a breakup or a loss of a child, losing a job, just your normal morning anxiety or a good three hours of existential crisis in the afternoon, it's all real to us at this moment. Whether you are a billionaire or a homeless person, we're all made to want things, to make connections, lose them, to witness births and deaths and to find meaning in our experience in this blurb of life. I'm Nia, and this has been Miss Knows Before You Die.